Hello and welcome to Sweet Spot DFS. This is a DFS review video for the 2021 Palmetto Championship where Garrick Higo is your winner. Now, if you've never heard of Garrick Higo, he is a 22-year-old South African who primarily plays on the European Tour. If you look at his stats, this now marks his third victory in his last five starts. So this kid has been scorching hot uh, over his last five starts. It includes two European wins. I think both of them were in Spain. And then uh, maybe, yeah, I think both of them were in Spain. And now a PGA Tour event. So that means we're going to see him on the PGA Tour. A win gives him exempt status at least for a year, if not two. Um, and we'll see him in major championships because I believe they got the full benefits of winning a golf tournament. The Palmetto Championship, if you recall, this is a one-time deal. I don't think they're going to renew anything. It would have to replace another tournament, and I don't think that's going to happen. Again, if you don't remember, this tournament replaced the RBC Canadian Open just for this year since they uh, canceled it three months ago um, and had to find something to fill that spot, and that's where this tournament was born. So, Garrick Higo, a South African, takes advantage of this. South Africans were pretty good in this tournament, uh, and this this golf course, Congaree Golf Course, was uh, was compared to a lot of the Australian sand, bu sand belt uh, golf courses. Now, I don't know if that has any correlation with South Africans, but they did well at this tournament. So, I mean, I don't think any of us really knew what to look forward to at this tournament. No course history, no even tournament history. Uh, a weak field. We had Dustin Johnson, the number one golfer in the world, was here. If you took him out, it was Brooks Kepka, and I think that's about it. I mean, there wasn't a lot. I went over it in the preview video, I believe. But yeah, uh, very difficult to, to kind of try to figure out the winners for this tournament. But before I go any further, I want to remind you guys, there are timestamps in the description below. Those timestamps can also be found on YouTube's progress bar. All you got to do is hover over the progress bar. You'll find timestamps that way. And a quick summary of what I'll cover. We'll go over results, just looking at the top 20 in on the leaderboard. We'll also look at the $1 GPP winning lineup versus the optimal lineup and see if that optimal lineup was realistic to get to. If not, we'll create a realistic optimal lineup. Um... And then I'll probably end this tournament or this review video with looking at, you know, top 20 stats for each category or top 20 golfers for each stat category. Uh, just to give you an idea of what this tournament is, I don't even know if it even matters since we're never going to see this tournament again. It's always fun kind of looking at it just to see, you know, a lot of the touts out there, a lot of the other guys that do this DFS anal uh, analysis, whether or not, you know, it's those are stats we even we should care about so we'll go over that again timestamps in the description below i want to start out with kind of a recap results you can see the top 20 leaderboard it's not pretty it's it's a one-time tournament so obviously i only have 2021 20, results garrick higo first place 11 under now the story here he had finished pr like while there were still three or four groups left on the course and he wasn't in first place i believe he was in third place everybody dropped down uh i believe your last group was harris english and chesson hadley those were the last two golfers on the uh, on the golf course and both harris english and chesson hadley were i think 12 under on hole 16. Uh, maybe one of them was 11 under but they were 12 under, so they were close. Or 13 under. I think it might have been 13. Both of these guys bogeyed 17. And then Harris English double bogeyed 18. And Chesson bogeyed 18. So he dropped two shots the last two holes. Harris English dropped three shots the last two holes. They, I mean, they weren't easy holes. So it's, I'm not going to really give them, you know, too much flack on that. But that, that Chesson Hadley really gave this one away. He was 14 under to begin the day with. He finishes at 10 under. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, he was four over for this round on Sunday. And he kind of has been known to, dare I say, choke. You know, he's had other opportunities where he's been close at the top of the leaderboard. But, yeah, 
obviously not good. Um, so by default, Garrett Kigo finishing at 11 under, he, he just watched as the other guys, uh, before or after him, I should say, fell off the face of the, the map of the face of the planet. And it by result becomes your winner. So obviously awesome for Garrett Kigo. As for Chesson Hadley and Harris English, not very good. And I believe Dustin Johnson at one point in time was 11 under as well. And then triple bogeyed hole 16, 15 or 16. And basically, you know, threw him out of the tournament. Dustin Johnson was my favorite golfer. Uh, Garrett Kigo, I had said in the strategy video, I'm not going to play any of him. And I'll tell you why once we get to the DK page. Had a lot to do with him being a European golfer with no strokes gain stats on the PJ Tour. But obviously, I was wrong. You know, a lot of us probably were wrong this week. The rest of this top 10, top 20 leaderboard, though, it's it's, it's amazing. Ryan Armour just continues to prove he's good on Bermuda. This was Bermuda, uh, a, a Bermuda golf course. Chesson Hadley, Bo Van Pelt showed up out of nowhere. Bo has a really nice golf swing. I, I've always known he's had a good golf swing, but He's just a guy who really, I don't know if it's because of an age thing, because he is kind of older. I have no idea if that's the cause of why he hasn't been playing very consistently on tour, but I like his golf swing. That's all I can say. Like, fundamentally, he has a really good golf swing. Ty Hatton, you know, when he came uh, into this tournament, I should say this, when he showed up on Monday or Tuesday, I think he had a press conference, and he had said he's a little rusty. He hadn't been playing golf for the last three weeks. And prior to those three weeks, I think he either got married or something like that. And then the three weeks prior to that, he had not been playing much golf. So like, you know, for six weeks, he wasn't playing a lot of golf. And then he, I think he entered a tournament, the PJ Championship. That's what it was. So the PJ Championship was the tournament he went to go uh, or he went to play with a three-week break before, and then after that PJ Championship, he had a three-week break once again. Um, so a lot of bad, you know, I, I just, I didn't feel comfortable playing Ty Hatton. I don't think a lot of people really felt comfortable playing uh, Tyrrell Hatton. So uh, kind of struck out there, but I will tell you I did play him. We'll go over tea time pairings and, and how that looked because that was part of the strategy video. Um, there was definitely a strategy with me playing him. Uh, also, by the way, I have my air conditioner running, so I don't know if that is being picked up at all. If it is, I apologize, but it is way too hot not to have it on. Um, and if I let it go, if I turn it off, it just gets super warm in here. It, it, it's, it's difficult to do. So that's, it's kind of my peace offering. Like hopefully you guys are okay with it, but I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't. I've done some, uh, sound checks and I didn't hear it. So hopefully it isn't uh, showing up on your guys' end. Anyways, going forward, Doc Reg Redman, great finish. Hudson Swafford, I actually played a lot of... I, I played Swafford and Redman and Vegas all in different lineups uh, with guys who didn't make the cut, like Brooks Kepka um, and some other guys. I, I'm not sure exactly who, but... These guys kind of popped on my model for a little bit, and I, I'll show that. We'll go over the sweet spot score. We'll go over the tee time pairings as well. So let's go ahead and just actually jump into uh, the next part. I don't really care to talk about the rest of these guys, but I, I guess really quickly, I'll, I'll show you all the South Africans that did well. All of them, all three of them. I thought there was a fourth one, but no, three. Wilco, Nienaber, Eric Van Royen, and Garrett Kigo. Yeah, it, I mean, if you had a feeling that South Africans were going to do well and you owned these three golfers, first of all, you gave yourself some salary relief, but then also you're doing really well because they did well. All right, moving on to the $1 GPP winning lineup versus the optimal lineup. I The highest entry fee stakes that I played was a $1, the, the $1 short game. So the winning lineup there, it, our golfers here highlighted in blue, we have Gary Kigo, Johnny Vegas, Tyrrell Hatton, Doc Redman, Seamus Power, who finished 19th, uh, and Soshi Kadaira, who also finished 19th. Let me sort this by uh, results. 
used up $50,000 of the salary and scored 587 points. Now, the optimal lineup, you could actually pick all six golfers, T2 and up. So the winner and five second place guys. That ended up being uh, the best one if we were to sort by DraftKings points. Gare Kigo, Johnny Vegas, Bo Van Pelt, Tyrrell Hatton, Chesson Hadley, and Doc Redman. Those six golfers, you used 48,300 salary. We know this isn't a realistic lineup because leaving that much money on the table invites so many more um, lineup creations that you can do that falling on this one would just, the chances are become so much less. So we need to find a lineup that's 49,000 or greater um, and I, I, I'll get to that. I, for, I forgot to mention the optimal lineup scored 644 points. Use up 48,300, scored 644 points. That is 60 points greater than the GPP winning lineup. So now with the, uh, the realistic optimal lineup, we just need to find something that beats the $1 GPP. That's $49,000 or above. That's more of a realistic lineup to me. And we got one right on 49,000 on the button. It scores 634.5 points, so it's 10 points, 9.5 points behind the optimal lineup. Obviously, we're still smoking the $1 GPP winning lineup. Uh, and it's all the golfers here highlighted in green. So we have Gary Kigo, Johnny Vegas, Bo Van Pelt, Tyrrell Hatton, Doc Redman, and David Lipsky. Now, if you're one of those that's like 49,000, that's a little too low also. Well, let's just swap. Uh, Bo Van Pelt with Chesson Hadley and basically minus ourselves five and a half points. With that, you take five and a half out of the realistic optimal lineup. We get like 629. That's still, still very good. It is beating the GPP winning lineup with no worries. And then the op that the salary used there would be 49,007 or 49,600. Obviously a $600 difference between Bo Van Pelt and Chesson Hadley. So, all in all, I, it was it was a weird week. I, I don't know how else to say it. Uh, the realistic optimal lineup would have used a 10, 9, 2, 8 K golfers, a 7, and a 6. Usually, it's pretty customary that there's always going to be a 7 and a 6 in the optimal lineup. Uh, and this, this week was no different. We could also use a 10 K golfer and then uh, a 9k golfer. But we do have two 8ks, one's an 8.3 and one's just a regular 8. You know, that easily could have been like an 85 and a 78 and then we'd have our our general, you know, lineup creation where it's a 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6. But this is, a, this is pretty close. Um, I tried building most of my lineups that way. I didn't really stick to it all like that strictly, but I, I, I tried going that route. Uh, one thing to note, uh, let's look at, you know, the, the sweet spot score. Let me put a filter on this first and then sort by um, results top to bottom. The sweet spot score actually wasn't terrible for golfers inside the top 10. We have one golfer who is 100 or greater. I always try to figure out, you know, I want half of the field Let's put it this way. There's 156 golfers in this field. So obviously I have a ranking from 1 to 156. I want the half mark, that halfway point, and lower inside the top 10. Obviously 102 isn't going to do it. 156 divided by 2, we have 78. So Dave Lipsky isn't going to make it. Chesson Hadley won't make it, but everybody else does. So three golfers do. Unfortunately, those two two of those golfers um, were in the optimal lineup, and obviously David Lipsky was in the realistic optimal lineup. So we needed those three golfers, right? Lipsky, yeah. So we needed those three golfers. They were above, you know, the the sweet spot score threshold that I'd be comfortable with. But all in all, if there's 156 golfers, 102 was the highest score. So that's that's pretty good, and it's I mean rank. It was the highest rank. So it's not terrible. Um, Garrick Higo, 32. We went over this. He's a 32 because he has no stats in anything. Uh, he had no Bermuda presence on the PGA Tour. 
He obviously didn't have any last week stats. His recent form stats come from the PGA Championship. So that was kind of a difficult uh, venue, a difficult golf course. So obviously not the greatest. So those stats all went into the score. He doesn't have any strokes gain stats. So there was no boost other than his 54th official World Golf ranking. Um, so he, 32. Now, if he had those stats, th this score might actually go up considerably. He just needed something. Uh, and I usually always put in like some kind of default value for golfers that don't have anything. Uh, and it's it's lower, like it's it's around average, but it's it's like 10% lower than average. So obviously he's not going to get a boost with it. He's still 32, so maybe that's what I should have thought about. Like, oh wow, 32 is not terrible with basically no stats other than official World Golf ranking going towards the rank. Um, but I'm not going to beat myself up over it. It was a one-off tournament. It was It was weird. But with this sweet spots uh, score or rank, I should say, I go by t I look at tee time pairings. So why don't we go ahead and do that? I'm gonna go ahead hide this information um, and just look at games. So the very first thing, okay, I'll sort by game. Actually, hold on. Look at positions. Golfers that are highlighted over here were golfers I talked about in the tee time pairings. So we did have seven golfer or six golfers we could have rostered just based off of who I talked about, probably not because the, the salary wouldn't allow it. But the one big thing that I do, uh, at least for the last three weeks, that's been working out, is I go here, I look at my fill color, um, I look at the darker green color. The dark green indicates that both their DK average and their scoring average is better than field average, and they're playing with two other golfers in their group. So all three have either scoring average better than field average, DK average better than field average, or both better than field average. So all three of them, and then their sweet spot rank is less than 100 all added together. So I'll show you what that looks like. You know, if we look at this first group, Sung JM, Brand Snedeker, uh, Patton Kazire, obviously it's all highlighted here, and this, this rank over here, it equals 25. So it's under 100. Here's the big thing that I do. I group these up by their their uh, tee time pairings, and I take a look. How many top 10 finishes do we see? And could we start our lineups that way? So what I ended up doing was I went, um, let's just start with Sungjae. I started with Sungjae, and I paired them up with everybody in each of the other groups. But hold on, I just made a twosome. So I'd start with Sung Jay, and then I'd put Sung Jay and DJ together. Remove DJ, put Kevin Kisner there. Remove Kevin Kisner, put JT Post in there. And then I'd go down the list, and I, you know, I did it that many times. I told you there were only 36, I think it was, like different permutations. I was way off. I, I did not do the calculation right. It ended up being 90. So I created 90 lineups going this route. Um, and obviously you can see, I would have gone on a DJ and a Tyrrell Hatton, which obviously I did, but then you need to get the right golfers together. So it worked this week. Uh, the last three weeks that I've been doing this, I've been just double checking to see if we do see top 10 finishes out of these groups. Cause obviously you can start here. This, this would be a group of 15 golfers, like a pool of 15 and just pair two of them up together. Now here's the, the bad thing about all this. Uh, missed cuts out of this entire group here. So if you did my strategy, you're putting a lot of lineups together with Luke List, Sepp Straka, and Camilo Vijegas. Not good. Same thing applies with Brooke Kep Brooks Kepka, Keith Mitchell, and Lucas Glover. Not good at all. I mean, the rest of these, if you didn't have Tyrrell Hatton or Matt Fitzpatrick or Dustin Johnson, it didn't work out. Like, it was just not the strategy you wanted to go with. My favorite golfer this week was Dustin Johnson. And it wasn't because he was the number one golfer. It was because when he plays the week before a U.S. Open, if his, let's say this, if he wins U.S. Opens or he does well at U.S. Opens, it's primarily, well, one of the, one of those stats, if you look at DJ doing well at the U.S. Open, is that he has a good week prior. 
So I kind of put my uh, my eggs in that basket, thinking, you know, DJ is going to get a top 10 finish here. And if he does, look out for him at the US Open. Now, he he kind of backdoored his way into a top 10 because Harris English doubled the last hole, pushing, you know, all those golfers that were at his score of minus 8. I think they were in 11th place, pushed him up to 10th place. So he did finish in the 10th, you know, in, in 10th place. Obviously he didn't finish well at the end, but played decent throughout the entire week. I mean, he would have he would have been tied with Garrick Higo uh, once regulation ended, and maybe go into playoff if he doesn't if he doesn't triple uh, hole 15 or 16. Either way, I like DJ because of that. I think he's a very good play at Tory next week. The top 10 finish is a very good sign. For Brooks, the, the miscut isn't a big deal. We'll talk more about that when it comes to the US Open. But I didn't like Brooks that much because he primarily doesn't play well the week before a major. At least not before a US Open. He's he's only finished top 10 maybe once or maybe... And I know he, I think he finished top 20 twice. Um, but for the majority of the time, he's finishing 30th, 50th, you know, just whatever. He misses the cut. I mean, 30-40, like 30th place or 40th place at 11,100, that's not good enough. DJ at 11-4, finishing 10th place, that's not good enough either. But I mean, if we look at these lineups, can we make a DJ lineup? We go. We start with 11-4, go to 9-8-6-1-6-7-8. That's 49,500. So we could go 11 9 8 8 6, 6. But if you're like, that's unreasonable to go two 6K golfers. Um, we can go seven, maybe not something there. Can we go like this? Yeah, this is 49,300. So two 6K golfers, a seven, 11, nine, and an eight. Can those golfers score more than the uh, winning lineup? I'm going to venture yes. Sorry, I gotta unclick all these. 612 yeah it would have beat 587 easy so dustin johnson could have got you there would that have paid for a salary no not really but are we like we we would have won a gvp so does that not pay for his salary like to me it does obviously 10th place that's not a very good you know return 86 points on his 11,400. you're usually trying to find 10x but or at least kind of trying to find 10x. Obviously didn't hear. I don't find an issue playing DJ. Anyways, let's move on. I like DJ. So the tea time pairings didn't quite work out as well as I wanted it to. Let's go ahead, take a look at... Oh, by the way, the bucket system, it was a universal bucket system looking at the last five weeks. I don't have anything to add to it. Garrett Kigo had no strokes gain stats. Nor did uh, David Lipsky. They both finished inside the top 10. They were a part of the uh, realistic optimal lineup. We had two guys here with negative off the tee, negative putting. Um, we had only DJ finishing inside the top 10 that had every stat positive. You know, every major stat. So that's off the tee, approach around the green and putting. Otherwise, yeah. Tyrrell Hatton had decent stats. So like DJ and Hatton... Great stats, but of all the top 10 golfers, 13 of them, oh, Fitzpatrick also, three of them out of 13 had positive off the tee and positive putting. If we just look at all the positive off the tee guys, there were four out of 13, so nine of them did not. So you could look, does off the tee really matter at this golf course? I don't know, because obviously Garrick Higo and David Lipsky do not have those stats, but even if you add those guys, that's only 5 out of 13 guys, or 6 out of 13 guys that have um, positive off the tee. So, it's a, it's a mix. It lo looked like off the tee didn't really matter that much. Um, but yeah, we can go ahead and move on. The bucket system to me just wasn't something to care about. You know, we had a bunch of last week ones, which were golfers who didn't play the week before. Uh, recent form ones that's that in between we had some twos most of them were threes so what were the threes again oh that 60 to 80 range so yeah a lot of guys with bad recent form finishing inside the top 10 and then strokes gain so like there wasn't a lot to talk about strokes gain stats 
One thing I do want to look at is Bermuda stats. So, oh, let's do this. Keep that position there so we can see it as we scroll over. Um, I can already tell that the Bermuda stats don't look that great, but if we go top to bottom and look at the position right here, hopefully that doesn't look too messy for you guys. We had a lot of top 10s for you know the top 20 golfers with Bermuda stats. We had some missed cuts, but for the most part, looking at overall Bermuda was a good thing to do at this tournament. And I mean, it was pure Bermuda, so there wasn't anything to really worry about there. Top 10 Bermuda percentage, nah. This is the success rate of them finishing inside the top 10. DJ will continue to increase that mark. So will Tyrrell Hatton, Matt Fitzpatrick, and that's it. Uh, 2021 Bermuda stats. We had uh, a few good guys right here. That's not terrible. But most of them are missed cuts, so it's it's hard to say that there's a lot of success here. Let's go ahead and move on. All I want to do is really look at um, season-long stats, looking at all your best off the tee golfers. It's a mixed bag, but primarily there were more missed cuts than there were top 10, top 20s. So off the tee wasn't a very good stat to look at. How about approach stats? More uh, missed cuts and withdraws. Then top 20, top 10s. How about around the green? That was a stat talked about a lot this week. Not so much. Putting? No, not at all. Uh, and then I kind of look at some of these miscellaneous stats. Did driving distance matter? Nope. How about accuracy? Driving accuracy. Not even close. Good drive percentage? Nope. Green and reg? No, not at all. Proximity. Nope. One putt percentage? Yeah, kind of. Two guys that were in the optimal lineup. How about one putt percentage between 5 and 10 feet? No. One putt percentage between 10 and 15 feet? No. This is one of those, those things that really no stat pops out. Birdie or better? Okay. We do have a few more top 20, top 10s with birdie or better, but only two guys in the optimal lineup. And that's it. Like I Total birdies are ba really based off of how many tournaments you've played in. Um, nothing. This, so there was no stat leading into this tournament that was really a corollary uh, other than overall Bermuda average. Like We found a lot of top 10s that way. And, I mean, that kind of was a thought process that came into this. You know, what stats should we look at? Or what stats should we look at? I told you Bermuda is probably the most important one. It ended up being the most important one. Uh, and then, obviously, looking at top to bottom on the leaderboard, if we just look at the top 10 golfers, Bermuda is not terrible. We do have a couple 0% that finish inside the top 10. Uh, Garrett Kago has no stats uh, for Bermuda. So obviously that in itself counts as a, a, a zero stat. But for the most part, I don't know. Yeah, I, I really don't have nothing. So, yeah, I think that's going to end it because I have nothing else to talk about. The Palmetto Championship, again, this is a one-off tournament. We're not really going to have a lot to talk about. Uh, really didn't. These reviews are for you guys, don't get me wrong, but it's also for me for next year's tournament to kind of review the review, like listen to the review, and see how we could have done better, um, where we could have done better, and really if anything matters that much. With the Palmetto Championship, we're not going to see this again, so there's really no point to do a review. It's just fun looking at this in hindsight to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we could have played this guy because of this, X, Y, Z. Uh, but, yeah, it's really nothing. Oh, one quick thing I want to mention. The U.S. Open qualifiers. This was something I talked about during the strategy. Would it matter uh, for golfers who finished or who played Monday, tried qualifying for the U.S. Open, which is 36 holes you had to do on Monday, uh, coming here, 
Especially if you had a last week um, event. If you played last week and made the cut. Hudson Swafford did. He qualified. He finished second. So it didn't really bother him. Um, and that's it. He's the only guy that played last week and also tried qualifying for the U.S. Open. Chesson Hadley did. Didn't make it. He finished the second. Uh, Johnny Vegas. He actually qualified. Did not withdraw. Finished second at this tournament. But yeah, we had quite a bit. Look at that. We had a total of seven golfers. Seven of 13 golfers qualifying for the U.S. Open on Monday. Finishing inside the top 10 here. So fatigue did not matter to these guys. Just pointing that out so you guys have that information. That's something we can take to next year um, for the, the Canadian Open when that comes back. But I think that's it. I have nothing else to say. So I'm going to thank you guys for watching. Please leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And let's get some U.S. Open content out there. I'll see you in that in the next video. All right, bye.